The time has come, I think, to talk about Marvel's newest black sheep of the family, which can only mean Eternals. It was directed by Chloe Zhao, who shared writing credits with Patrick Burley and Kazan Ryan Furpo. I've only read that name, I don't know how it's said, I apologise if that's wrong. With the original characters being created, of course, by Jack Kirby. It stars Gemma Chan, Richard Madden, Kit Harrington, Angelina Jolie, Salma Hayek, Brian Tyree Henry, Lauren Ridloff, Kamal Nanjiani, Ma Dong Suk. All these people, they are great. And I loved the fact that we had a great cast in this. But I've waited this long for two reasons to do this video. First one is I hadn't seen it yet until it was on streaming. I couldn't justify at the time affording it. I'm not big enough a channel to get pre-release screenings or anything like that. I don't think I've got enough clout that I could even ask for it legitimately. But also the fact of now it's on streaming, everyone has theoretically had a good chance of seeing it if they want to. I do think that's the current moratorium on spoilers that makes sense to me. Wait until everyone has had a chance to view it. If you couldn't get to the cinema because you couldn't afford it, you're probably going to be able to watch it at home in some format. So that's what I would go for, unless I really have to get a video out if I've seen it in the theatres. But yes, I finally got around to watching this, and I, I'm in the middle. I'm definitely aware of its shortcomings. I'm aware of why people wouldn't like it so much, but I also do appreciate what it was trying to do. People are very quick to say, oh, Hollywood just throwing out another blockbuster at us. You know, do we want constant lasers and explosions? But then something like this comes along that isn't just lasers and explosions. And people go, well, that's not what I wanted. You can't have it both ways. It's the same idea as the issue facing a lot of independent films. People say they don't want all this stuff, you know, that's remakes a, a galore or milking a franchise until it's dry. But then something... You know, an independent film comes along that's really well thought out and creative and deep and meaningful and people don't go and see it because they go and see the big flashy thing that they said apparently they don't want. Unfortunately, studios only decide what happens because of your money. Where that goes is what they think works and therefore that's what they will fund. Independent productions are failing because of this because they can't do the big budget things. They can't do the big explosions. So they do the simple stuff or the emotional deep stuff. Don't say you, you, you want this and don't take it. And that's what I felt with Eternals. It's still under the Marvel brand, yes, and it is still characters created by them, but it was a more thoughtful, considered piece. So if you've gone in going, it's a Marvel film, so I'm expecting big explosions, a, a fun plot, and we're just going to get you know big showdown and all that kind of stuff, you are going to be disappointed. I understand why Chloe Zhao said... I want to do this project. I think Marvel wanted her for something else. I might be misremembering that, but she was like, I want to do this. I've, I've got an idea. I, I could make this go. I, I would be more fulfilled. And they were like, yeah, fine, do it. In interviews before and after its release, she's been very, yeah, this is what I wanted to do. And like I say, I understand it. We have a story of people who are given one idea their entire existence is they're saving this planet because these people need protection from these awful creatures one of them knows the truth and over time many years later of course other people know the truth and then of course we get to the more modern times and everyone learns the truth it's very realistic you know if you were suddenly told that everything you believe was a lie you wouldn't necessarily completely rail against it instantaneously you may, ever, you may never. You may be like, well, that's okay. It's not what I expected, but fine. That's what, that's what my purpose is. That's what my goal in life is, whatever it may be. And we do see that split. There are people in this team who are like, yeah, okay. That's what it really was. I stand by it. But there are others who have built connections to this world and to the people in it and don't want something bad to happen. There are those who have deep connections even with other members and the team. And they go, well, if that's what they think, if that's what they want, I want their happiness and I will do anything to, to make that happen. So maybe I don't agree with it myself, but they do, so I'll go with them. We have members of the team who just left to live a plain, boring life. We have some who wanted the limelight. We have another just, yeah, it's, 
it's there. It's not, you know, in your face. I know a lot of people probably would think any uh, same-sex relationship would be in your face in a film if it doesn't need to be there. But I do like the fact that we have that representation with Fastus's family. And it shows his connection to the world, which is why he doesn't want it to go away. We have all of these things, and... Like I said, these creatures, these beings, find out that, yes, their mission is not what they thought it was, but also they're effectively kind of, I don't know, really complex androids. And they're not just normal living beings. They're not gods from Olympia, as they believed, even though we learn throughout that they're effectively, in a lot of cases, what we took as gods or creatures from myth and history. We have Gilgamesh, who likely created the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's quite good that in one of the big action scenes that everyone apparently wants, he is fighting something that's bull-like. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, including the story of Gilgamesh and the bull, does make some sense. We see that Sprite partly creates some of these stories, or at least furthers them, with her illusions as well. So there's a lot to love in here. There's some really funny moments. Kamal Nanjiani is great in this. There's a few things I've seen him in before this, but he's not really been massively on my radar. But his delivery and everything is great here. And I, you know, I love the character. I love what he brings. And of course, his valet who follows him around, he's great as well. You know, we've got to look at some of the smaller side characters, I think, in this as well. But we, of course, have Lauren Ridloff in it, playing Makari, who was probably a basis of Mercury because of the speed. It's so nice to see. I know in interviews and everything like that, she was so elated about the fact that we have this representation of a deaf character. She's meant to be a perfect being, if you think about it. She's been created by the Celestials for this job. Is being deaf a skill set that would be necessary for saving the world? Probably not. But she is, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't impede her ability to be a functioning part of the team. And I absolutely love the fact that they included that. They could have just given it to anyone. But the fact that they said, no, we'll, she's good for the role. We'll have the character as deaf. It's fine. I don't know if it was written that way and they were looking for a deaf person. I can't remember if I've seen anything about that. But even if they weren't, the fact that they considered her, and if they were, well... She's good in the role, so I'm glad it went to her. But that's it. It's There's so much here that I appreciate that they went for something different. They tried something new. They allowed a story that wasn't just saving the world, high-octane energy all the way through. There are some great action scenes. There's some great moments and a lot of decent CGI. There's some slightly ropey ones. But for the most part, yeah, it's fine. And of course... We can't talk about a Marvel film without talking about end credit scenes. There are two, as there are normally. And the first one introduces us to... I forgot that that was Harry Styles. I was like, wait a minute, that's Harry Styles playing the brother of Thanos, Eros. And the voice of Patton Oswald as Pip the Troll. Which was a lot more kind of light-hearted than most of the film had been, to be honest. It felt a bit disconnected, but again, they always have to set up what's coming, so fine. But the last one, which gave me chills when I realised who it was. We have Mr Whitman, played by Kit Harrington, looking at the Ebony Blade, being tempted by it. All of a sudden, a voice comes out of nowhere. Sure you're ready for that, Mr Whitman? And I was like, I know that voice. Why do I know that voice? Because it was Mahershala Ali. I'd actually recently been re-watching the Hunger Games films, which I may do videos upon in the future. But he, of course, plays Boggs in that, in the latter parts anyway. And of course, that's why his voice was so familiar to me. But I didn't click that that was Blade. We have Mahershala Ali finally, technically, in his first, not appearance, because he doesn't appear, first official role, there we go, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I'm quite ready for Blade now. I'm eager for it. Eternals isn't as bad to me as a lot of people say. I understand the misgivings but I appreciate it for what it was. And it's nice once again to see Gemma Chan playing basically a really nice android. If you've seen the Channel 4 series Humans, you know exactly what I mean. But yeah, everyone did a good job on this. And whilst I don't think it was perfect, I'm not defending it to the hilt. 
of course. I know there's problems. But I appreciate that they were trying to do something different. They were shaking it up. And to be honest, it's not as bad as some of the other black sheep out there in this universe. So that's all I'm going to say about Marvel's Eternals. So thank you very much for watching. And as always, until next time, take care.